I, I don't know if I ever told you this, but uh, actually I am pretty new to Miami. I've been uh, transferred from New York eight years ago. I was pretty much amazed by the energy that Miami has in terms of the vibrant tech scene here. And you're probably wondering, what's his secret? So there's a couple of drivers that work well for Miami. First one, I would say is diversity. So if you look at the uh, Miami-Dade County, out of the 2.7 million residents, over half actually coming from different countries, including myself. And another one is that there is such a great activity here in terms of accelerators, incubators, VCs, mentor networks. I belong to several. And above all, we have here amazing quality of life, great weather. So we like to get together with people. We enjoy having fun and exchange ideas. And of course, we are strategically located to be a springboard to Latin America, which is another great bonus. So what I want to talk to you about today is really how can we get all this energy and momentum in Miami and really drive it uh, for social impact. More, more so, I'd like to talk about how we can leverage the power of visual storytelling to really drive that social impact innovation. So to help me unpack this uh, fantastic topic, I have here a great friend and one of the top leading change agents in Miami for the past couple of years for all her amazing accomplishments. Uh, that's uh, Leanne Buchanan. She is the president and CEO of the Miami Dead Innovation Authority. Welcome to the show, Leanne. Thank you, Shlomi. I'm super excited to be here. And the, the question you asked at the top is such a tall order that I know we're going to have a great conversation. No, I know. Yeah, definitely. So just to set the stage for everybody so they can get to know you a little bit better, maybe you can share your backstory and what made you get your first interest in tech, innovation, and particularly in social impact. Excellent. So I am originally from Canada, and my family background is uh, Jamaican on, on both sides. Oh, wow. And so wow. like you, I'm an immigrant to the U.S. and also the first generation to be born outside of Jamaica. So it's an interesting uh, juxtaposition of experiences when your culture and background might be a little bit different from the place that you're seated. I'm a recovering attorney by trade, so I practiced complex commercial litigation and white-collar defense for just about eight years before I made the jump into tech and innovation. And even before I moved formally into tech, for the last 15 years or so, my body of work has really centered at the intersection of really exploring how leaders can use tech and innovation to accelerate equity, opportunity, and to make social investments more inclusive. And what that's looked like is this kind of interesting hodgepodge of social impact organizations that I've had the pleasure of launching or leading that I think collectively when we looked at the numbers, has helped to unlock just about $75 million in capital to help bridge systemic gaps in, in access and opportunity. And so we met when I was the founding executive director of Venture Cafe. And we'd spent yep. a lot of time together, used to host different sessions. And for those who are not familiar, in Miami, Venture Cafe was focused on making sure the innovation ecosystem was, was more inclusive, more accessible, and better connected through convening people on a weekly basis to expose them to new ideas, educational opportunities, yep. access to capital, and really kind of shifting the cultural fabric of who we consider to be innovators and how innovation could permeate our community. Absolutely. Over the five years, we served about 55,000 people, worked with about 1,000 organizations. And I know we're going to talk about some of my other projects from NIA Project yep. to Yemi, but but really... I kind of landed in tech because I realized that tech is a tool and it is a tool that can be used to accelerate equity just because it is a force multiplier. Tech really is able to quickly, easily, with low barriers, exponentially increase the impact and reach of any given 
goal or objective. And then innovation, which by definition is really just the process of creating something new is... Or the conditions, you might say. Exactly. Was really what's needed to help solve some of the biggest and most pressing challenges at a cultural level, a community level, and a global level. That's amazing. Yeah. So... Interesting uh, comment. I didn't know that you're from Jamaica because I actually used to work there when I was uh, working for cable and wireless. So my entire social media team was there. So I was visiting quite often. Amazing country. Uh, I really love my time there. So, and you're absolutely right. Definitely all the things you talked about and especially the, the work you've done for Venture Cafe. I, I held several sessions there and had amazing time uh, networking with great people. So I think uh, this uh, activity is still going strong, and but you actually planted the seeds. So that's really amazing. So before we delve deeper into your current role, this is a question I ask all my guests. And it's really very simple. How do you define visual storytelling from your perspective? Well, that's a hard one. I think I could probably go with the most logical definition. I think visual storytelling would be the way in which we translate the emotions and the imagery of a story into a visual medium. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah, definitely you touched on all the key ingredients. So that's cool. And yeah, so we're going to talk more about visual storytelling and how it's integrated into your work. Uh, but maybe just to set the scene even more for our audience, maybe you can talk a little bit about, uh, give us an overview of the, the Miami-Dade Innovation Authority, your mission and your role in it. Yeah, excellent. So I currently serve as president and CEO of the Miami-Dade Innovation Authority, and it's a relatively new um, organization that was actually the vision of Mayor Daniela Levine Cava, who, who is mayor of Miami-Dade County. Uh, she went to Israel and got a chance to meet the Israeli Innovation Authority and was so impressed by the way in which the Israeli Innovation Authority really serves as an important catalyst for tech startups in Israel, often putting those first investment, those first dollars in that are critical to help these startups grow and scale. And also they're serving along for opportunities for follow-on investment as they grow. And so what's interesting about our work is that we represent one of the first efforts where a municipal government has granted an external entity dollars to invest into private startups. So what we do is we identify and we invest in startups from around the world who have technology and innovative solutions that are responsive to public challenges that we issue that relate to quality of life, looking at things from climate, housing, healthcare mobility, education, and opportunity. And then once we make an investment to the winning companies who submit their solution to a challenge, we then facilitate these public pilots. The opportunity by working hand in hand with our economic engine, so government, anchor institutions, hospital systems, and the like, to help facilitate these pilots, the ability to test and validate their solutions that we hope will help clear their pathway to revenue also resulted maybe commercial opportunities. And really our work has two goals. One, we want to accelerate the rate that innovate, innovative solutions are embedded into the private sector by creating this flywheel effect of these ongoing challenges. But secondly, we know that we're going to need more innovation to improve quality of life for Miamians. Yeah. And so really the bridge between private sector innovators and uh, public sector or institutions that serve a large portion of the public to be able to connect and really get more solutions out there. And it helps us to de-risk future investment by later venture capitalists or other communities that want to use a solution of a company that we've supported because there'll be proof of concept. They will have validated the proof right. of value of their Absolutely. technology. Yeah. And as a public entity, do you also provide support in terms of, uh, you know, any bureaucratic or achieving certifications uh, by different government offices? like the? We're actually a nonprofit. So we're an independent nonprofit. We're not government, but we work oh, okay. hand with government. 
And so because of our partnership with Miami-Dade County in particular, we're able to help to facilitate companies who have the opportunity to test and validate or pilot their solutions. So helping them navigate what would otherwise be an opportunity that for early stage startups could be unreachable. One, they wouldn't have the capital needed because public pilots happen at the expense of an organization. And two, early stage companies may not have the bandwidth or the connectivity or the dollars perhaps to pay the type of lobbyist or representative to help right. navigate the process into beginning to work with government or larger institutions. Yeah, that's an important angle for people that might consider have some, you know, ideas uh, that require some certifications uh, from the FDA and others. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about, about visual storytelling. So if you look at your work in the different organization that you led, and you can talk about even the current one, what is your pretty much a typical visual storytelling strategy when you want to bring to life the vision of the organization? That uh, is a great question. I, and you, you and I have talked about this in the past, and if you look yep. at every project that I've had the pleasure of leading, you're going to see an anchor storytelling piece or a series attached to it. For example, with Venture Cafe, we did a several different series. We always had videos and recaps, but there was one series that we, we, we did, which was called VCM Connects, where we wanted to tell the story of the engineered serendipity that happened and the types of our tagline was connecting innovators to make, thing make things happen, but we wanted to tell the story of what happened as a result or a connection point to the people that engaged with Venture Cafe. And that was a deep dive series on different stories of, of innovators. But I would say, I think my go-to strategy is once we're clear on what is the vision of yep. impact, who are the beneficiaries? Yep. And and what is who is the audience that we are trying to engage? And oftentimes there are different stories for different audiences. If they're donors or potential funders, for example, there's a different story that we're going to tell that may have a little bit more data and a little bit more structure. If it's the everyday donor, we want to pull at their heartstrings. But ultimately what we do is I go back to Aristotle's rhetorical triangle and I make sure yes. we're seeing yeah, have ethos. logos, ethos, and ethos. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I'm using it all the time. So it's funny you mention it. <laughs> every, every communication. And so we will map out a strategy of micro content and an anchor content piece or series of pieces that we produce to both showcase, to create awareness, to, to educate, to activate, to call to action, as well as to to get people clear on, on what the organization endeavors to do. That's interesting. So basically you have core hero content that creates that splash and then you have supporting uh, materials that uh, basically provide uh, more awareness and air, more airtime frequency for people to notice it because part of the challenge of any communication today is really rising above the noise. So you're going to have a frequency. That's cool. And, and in general, when you once you have the strategy in place, do you have any particular process that you follow? Yep. So I think in the next part of my life, I'll be doing much more content creation, not in the influencer sense, but more in the storytelling sense. Yep. Uh, typically, we, we I'll typically say, okay, we need to tell a story. And so we'll jump in a room. I will sometimes do my brainstorm on a whiteboard myself. Then I'll get our team together. We work I work very closely with an amazing DP videographer, Nito from VideoWorks here in Miami. Yep. A lot of my projects, he's our go-to guy. We even nice. did a documentary together. And so we'll internally as a team map out like the arc, what we want to, what we want to communicate yep. for the characters. What's the story that we're trying to tell? How does that shore up to the website? What's happening? And Call then, to action, probably at the exactly. end. We'll map it all out on a whiteboard, and then often, then I'll call, I'll call Nito and say, "Here's, here's what we're working on. Let's, let's get on the Zoom. We'll talk through it. He'll also make suggestions on the types of shots, um, because I direct. I typically know the types of shots that I'm looking for, but we've worked so closely together. He's such an amazing videographer that he'll, he'll have a lot of agency to ad lib, and then we walk through what the production process is going to look like, 
And then we go to pre-production, production, post-production, post and then distribution. Great. Got it. And you have team members from your staff uh, contributing, I'm guessing, right? From people working uh, at different front lines with uh, different stakeholders, donors versus entrepreneurs, right? Yeah, typically on a given project, I do a lot of the conceiving and directing, but then the process is collaborative as we map out the, the shoot strategy. And then they'll typically be a person that serves as the PA or production assistant or the production lead that's doing the logistics the coordination, yeah. the outreach, all of the things that I, it's not my, not my uh, whole game. And then I typically, depending on the type of project, am involved in the editing process in, in some projects. And I know we're going to talk about the documentary that I directed yep. and produced, but that one was, I was super involved. Like I did the, I did the script, uh -huh. if you will. So I did. Storyboard, we basically. Basically, the storyboard, once we recorded all the interviews, I actually went line by line and scripted oh, wow. the whole thing. And then this is what we, these are the cuts that we want. And then I scored the whole thing, helped to license the music. Oh, wow. and it went <laughs> second to Amazing. identify the score that we needed for the 26 minute and 13 second documentary. That's incredible. So you are really down the weeds kind of a storyteller. <laughs> That's amazing. So I guess that's going to be a good segue to maybe see some examples. Do you want to give the, maybe the introduction about what we're going to see? Sure. So this one, I didn't, I'm in it, but this is, this is my TED talk. And this is a TEDx talk about this idea that we need to reimagine who we call innovators. And oh, Shlomi, from being in practice at Venture Cafe, that we had a very broad definition of who could be an innovator. And so this is the TED Talk where I introduce a framework that I developed in a quiz to help anybody discover their hidden innovator style. But I also think the first couple of seconds, if you play the first 30 seconds only, you'll see that I have a visual storytelling element that really reinforces the main point of what we're talking about. Brilliant. So let's watch. Leanne Buchanan. I am an innovator. But I look nothing like these folks. You see, the stories we tell about the world's greatest innovators often exclude people that look like me, people from diverse background experiences and identities. By definition, innovation is simply the process of creating something new. In fact, it comes from the root two Latin words, in and novus, meaning into new. Innovation itself is identity neutral, yet it's the culture of innovation that perpetuates this notion that some of us are born with a special set of skills or an innate predisposition to being natural born innovators. Let me share with you a few examples of why this very narrow and time to This is amazing. This is, I love the introduction. I think you did really. I always say the first 30 seconds of any presentation are the most crucial because that's where your emotional brain works. And you did it beautifully by connecting with those uh, innovator portraits and contrasting with your journey, which is, was completely different. So I think that was a fantastic example right there. Time's exclusive view of innovation. When I teach students how to write essays, college essays, because that's a yep. lot of part of one of the examples we'll talk about, I tell them, don't write an essay, write a TED Talk. And we focus so hard on that hook. And I think in visual storytelling, that hook, the first 30 seconds will make or break whether or not you want to continue watching. And so even in that TED Talk, I don't even need to say much, but you can see the stark contrast between me, my skin tone, how yeah. I've had, and then... No, it was beautiful. I, I think it was amazing. What you did there was really brilliant. And I'm just going to open another one. Do you want to give some introduction about this a little bit? Sure. So NIA Project is a nonprofit that I started about nine years ago in 2014 to help clear the pathway to college for underrepresented students. And we provide uh, training and tech-based tools to individual students and organizations who embed our content, embed our platform in with the goal of improving college access outcomes. And so when we launched the tech platform, we knew we mm -hmm. needed to have some type of visual story 
that really explain why we're doing this and what it's about. And so this one you can play a little bit more because it, it gets into the student stories, uh, I think, really nicely. Awesome. My parents are from Cuba and Haiti, and I was the first in my family to attend college. And this was the first time I had ever done many of these application processes. And I had to essentially take it all and do it by myself. And I think access made it more attainable by the videos, the mentorship, and uh, the ability to just ask questions about the, the process. So my parents are first generation, and that makes me the first um, kid to go to college. My parents didn't have money to pay for a college coach, so that's why I'm so grateful for an opportunity to get feedback and tutorials from Access. My parents could not pay for a private college counselor. So Access was there for me when I needed things like scholarships or any deadlines or any more financial aid that I didn't know even existed. It is critical for students who come from low-income backgrounds to have access to equitable education and uh, training for their next steps. It wasn't until like I started going to private like institutions and things of that sort that I saw like these students really have coaches and counselors to prepare them for years since like elementary, middle school to get into the best schools and to tailor like their story and package them in that way to present themselves when it comes time to apply to college. Access is important to have online and available to students because oftentimes we don't have the coaching that's necessary or we can't afford the coaching that enables one to present their story in a way that's marketable to college universities. I myself am low income and so I definitely did not have the money to have the peer tutor or have a coach to teach me how to interview. My parents did not have money. This is cool. I've noticed uh, exactly what you talked about earlier. It's interesting the, how you actually direct the angles because I've noticed three types of angles. One, which is frontal where they present themselves. And then you go to a close up either from sideways or mm -hmm. more frontal just to get to more intimately to know the person. Yes. Then you show them in context, like uh, doing something uh, while studying, while developing a new idea. So I think that paints a, a nice visualization a range of the capability of, of the, the person. So, Yeah, I think it keeps people interested. I think the average attention span has dropped from 20 seconds to eight seconds. Yeah. And we like to mix it up. I also am a big fan of showing not telling. And yep. so you'll see in that clip, we had the exact actual platform that they're talking about. Right. You didn't talking about how he's used it. Then you show him using it. You have the other student working with a coach. And so I, one of the best pieces of advice that came from Marta Siebenhar, who you might right. remember, who now leads the business healer, but before it was culture and innovation. She used to do the play workshops at Venture Cafe. And she said, show, don't tell. Yep. You have an amazing impact, but unless you start doing videos and showing it, people aren't going to understand. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is something that I'm also <laughs> suggesting to my students at the brand storytelling course that I lead at the business school here at you. And the beauty of telling a story from a first person perspective of the actual ideal customer that you want to target mm -hmm. is priceless because once you start using narrators and journalistic approach, creating a distance. It's not about you. It's about just some, somebody telling me a story. You're missing the empathy bridge. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You're, you're dead on. And here's the thing. We're impacting students. Who exactly. doesn't want to hear from the students themselves? Like I could say it all the time, but it's right. not, not as compelling to your point unless you hear it from those who are impacted and that video is a little bit long, but we actually cut it up into different segments. So we yep. might use different segments of it that speak to a certain point. There's a later segment where it's the wins, where they right. just explain, like, I, I got a million dollars in scholarships. I got $500,000 in scholarships. Yep. It's this, this exciting moment that gives a nice arc. Absolutely. And speaking about arc and journey, I'm curious, in your current role when you're developing a visual storytelling strategy, we talked earlier about uh, different story types. So if we focus specifically on entrepreneurs, startups, founders, do you create uh, stories that uh, correspond to each stage in their buyer's journey, basically? That's a good question. So MGIA is still relatively new. We're about six months in 
of actual operations. And so we're actually at the point where we're starting to have the conversation about what our visual storytelling journey will look like and, and mapping that out. Yep. I think social media on one hand, and we've got a team that's focused Discovery. on Discovery, yep. Exactly, and awareness. But then the what I really care about are those impact stories. And that's yep. where we bring in someone like Nito and VideoWorks. And right. for that, what I want to tell the story of, there's a couple of things. One, we, we issue these public challenges that are on big issues that impact quality of life. And so there's a couple of story threads that we want to weave. One, yep. we want to create a piece that tells, gives, gives some education on the issue. Uh -huh. It'll be interesting. So when we launched the, the first challenge back in July, that was focused on finding solutions to beneficially repurpose sargassum seaweed. Yeah, um, I saw that. This is amazing. Yeah. Environment. We um, brought Nito in to just do B-roll, to shoot drone footage of sargassum. And then the mayor herself took some of our visuals and then put out a reel where she's talking about the problem and, and why it is something of importance to Miamians from a public health standpoint to also the opportunity for a circular economy. Yep. And so we want to have those educational threads. The second story that I know we want to tell is the story of the individual entrepreneurs who we invest in, their company. Oh, the success stories, yeah. Their success stories, but also background stories. I think you, I you might be familiar with my podcast, Innovation City, that I'm a co-host of, and that's about the people behind the innovation. So these stories are about the people Oh, the, their journeys. The the innovation itself. And then the third thread of stories that we want to tell are stories around success, to your point. What did we learn? What is the impact? How many startups did we touch? Did we have an event that showcased our impact? So we want to tell that success and impact story more broadly. Got it. And to maximize the impact of all these type of stories, a do you do any particular research to validate the problems that you want to showcase or actually must have versus nice to have? So I would say the research comes because we're running the program. And so that will inform how we decide to tell the story. Once we pick a, a company, we're going to learn about them because we're helping them facilitate oh, their I see. pilot. And so we're going to learn about them. Yeah. What name is best to tell the story? We're going to know more about their business because we've read all of the documentation that they've submitted. Sure. We've done our due diligence. And so I think that an important point for your, your audience and your community to be aware of, is sometimes we have to be able to look at diverse forms of research. There is research that you just look on the internet and you get the, da the data in the yeah, back. Yeah. Indirect. But then there's that experiential research that sometimes we overlook that you can get a lot of insights to inform your storytelling process from the day-to-day -day activities. No, this is great. One thing I'm curious, uh, I'm sure you probably came across this uh, question. Uh, what would you say is the common misconceptions about social impact innovation that you need to mystify? <laughs> So one of the common misconceptions is that, and, and, and this comes by an extension of your question to like nonprofit status, yep. one of the common misconceptions is that you should not make money and you should not have a business model. You can do well by doing good. And I think what I have learned over just, just about the last decade in this space is um, not every issue has a private market opportunity. There's not always a business model for every issue that you're seeking to solve. And so if, you, if you're if you an entrepreneur and you want to build a business around it, sure. don't forget about the business case. Don't forget to do the proper analysis to understand who is the beneficiary versus who is your customer. And sometimes those are very different parties. And so from a storytelling perspective, there's different messaging that you have to develop content around one for the beneficiary, one for the customer, because oftentimes in social impact, they yeah. made two different parties. Interesting. No, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So looking back at your track record and even in the six months in <laughs> your current position, I'm sure you probably shaped some uh, point of view about uh, what makes uh, Miami-Dade in general such an exciting space. I talked a little bit about it in my intro, but I'm curious about your perspective. So I've been thinking a lot about this. We launched our first challenge under our climate focus. 
Mm -hmm. And I think what makes Miami interesting, and I wrote about this when I got a chance to help draft the Miami Tech Manifesto, is that we are a community, a very historically transient community. More than I think 60% of the population of Miami is foreign born, as you mentioned. But that, and we're also facing some really serious challenges. We have challenges around afford, rising afford, affordability, lack of affordable housing stock. Um, we are the, we represent the third largest uh, public school district in the country. We also have some existential threats that we're we're navigating around around climate change um, from the impacts of these hundred year storms becoming more frequent. Although we've been lucky the last couple of years, hopefully the pattern is changing. Yep. To, to things like sea level rise and saltwater yep. intrusion from the West, sea level rise from the East, we're literally sinking. And so many people would frame these as deficits, but I think what makes Miami unique and special is that we, particularly those of us in the tech and the innovation and the social impact community, are beginning to reframe these as assets to see that our biggest obstacles be, can become the greatest opportunities to which we apply innovation. The engines of innovations, basically. Exactly, to develop solutions that not only apply here in Miami, but can be uh, replicated across the globe in other communities that are facing similar challenges. So I think our big opportunity exists around sustainability, around climate, around finding ways to create clear pathways for economic and social mobility when you have such big disparities in economic, socioeconomic opportunity. So I think we're, 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 we're turning our threats into opportunities where tech can find a solution. Yeah, no, it's a great uh, way to look at it, kind of turn these lemons into lemonade that's actually going to generate more innovation. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so speaking about uh, Miami-Dade and uh, your track record, when you look at the future, where do you see Miami in the next five to 10 years and its role in the global stage? So the grand vision that I share with, with our mayor at the county level and also Francis Suarez, the city of Miami mayor as well, and so many other people in the space that I, that I am privileged to occupy is that we think that, that Miami is strategically positioned to be a global and equitable hub for innovation and technology. Our close proximity and being at the center point of the Americas makes us geographically uniquely positioned. I also think that with that influx of capital and energy, that that companies are no longer choosing the old hubs like the New York, San Francisco, Silicon Valley area as their landing spot, but I think they're looking at some of these emerging markets that have a lot more to offer. Miami's diversity, as you mentioned at the outset, where we are a majority minority city from a racial and ethnic demographic perspective, makes us more representative of global cities demographically than perhaps some of the other hubs for technology, maybe with the exception of New York, for example. And so when you test things here, you are going to be able to test the culture and attitude of a very diverse population that you might not be able to do in a more homogeneous city. And I think the other thing that makes Miami unique is because our population is so transient, we're transient in terms of people anchoring here, but also because we're so close to Latin America, the Caribbean, a lot of people go home. (laughs) We're not immigrants that like move to a place and like don't go regularly. Many people are in their home countries two, three, four, five plus times a year. There was a point where I went to Jamaica every other weekend when my mom was a visiting scholar at the university. And so what that means is there's a lot of friends that just happen to be like coalescing in Miami in a way that wouldn't be as resonant and as relevant than other markets where the population is is, is fixed and not as dynamic. I see. So it's it's not just the connection within Miami, but it's the interconnection, the native countries exactly. that's creating that difference. No, this is fantastic. Well, it's been amazing chatting. And just say before we close, this is something I'm curious for other folks listening or watching this episode, and maybe they are also in the social impact space. 
what would you say your top three tips for them if they want to really maximize the impact from uh, using visual storytelling? I would say don't wait until you have the perfect story baked or the perfect visuals. Start small, start micro. I think micro stories, there's a, there's a Instagram site that I follow called, there's a couple of Instagram sites that are an example of this, Humans of New York. It's a photo. Oh, yeah. But it's so compelling from a visual storytelling. Sure. Thing. Brief but spectacular is another one that I absolutely love. These are sub 60 second documentaries. And so you don't necessarily have to go long form to have an impact. The second thing I'll say is start telling your stories early because that will give you an opportunity to allow your story to evolve and for you to get practice in experimenting. The third piece of advice that I have is. I think this is really important is when you begin to think about storytelling, try to remember to make evergreen content. So at the beginning, I wasn't always as thoughtful from a directorial and an editing standpoint uh -huh. to focus on ensuring content is evergreen. But once it's on the internet, it's there forever. And sure. so then you yeah. can make it evergreen and then you do any date tags in the comments, but not necessarily in the actual story. The more you can reuse it, you could repurpose it, you could flashback. And a lot of times the stories we tell will remain sustainable and enduring over time. Yeah. And today there are so many tools that allows you to slice and splice say, your content and repurpose it. So it's much easier. No, these are amazing tips. Uh, thank you so much. And last question, if people want to reach out and ask questions, what's the best way to contact? So the best way to contact me, so I have a website, www.leannebuchanan.com. So you can join my newsletter. There's an email there to reach out to me. Honestly, I'm really active on on Instagram. So leann.buchanan, <laughs> more time on Instagram than I care to admit. But if you slide in my DMs, I actually look at all my messages. I'm also on LinkedIn. But to be honest, I check LinkedIn much less than I check Instagram. Instagram is probably once an hour. So that's awesome. the best way to get in contact. Brilliant. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Leanne. I've learned so much. And it's always great to chat with you. Always have amazing insights, especially about the Miami ecosystem, innovation ecosystem. So thank you so much. And for all of you watching or listening, we'll see you in the next episode of the Visual Storytelling Today podcast. Thank you. Thank you.